Fenduik 6 has proved herself on the toughest leg of the race. Tabali has led all the way from Cape Town to take line honours at Sydney, with Sayula taking the handicap prize. But Penduik 6 is shortly to be dismasted for the second time, only 200 miles out of Sydney. Great Britain too has lost her mizzen and broken two spinnaker poles, and it's been a hard leg for adventure, with steering problems causing a drop in handicap position that will cost her the race. A delayed start gives a little more time to enjoy Sydney's welcome and get vital repairs carried out. Several yachts have suffered knockdowns and all have minor damage. Back in Port Elizabeth, Burton Cutter is careened. Her damaged bow sections are re-welded, but the repairs take longer than expected and she's forced to withdraw. Fleet, now reduced to 14, are bound for Rio. The Australian summer soon gives way to the freezing cold of the deep southern ocean and the crew prepare for adventure. But on GB2, Bernie Hosking is lost south of New Zealand in icy seas. He'd already been rescued on the voyage to Cape Town, but this time his luck runs out. GB2's crew press on with renewed determination, taking a northerly course and are soon 500 miles clear of their nearest rivals heading for Cape Horn. Modern electronic instruments are a great help to a racing crew who constantly need to adjust their sails for maximum performance. They enable relatively inexperienced yachtsmen to achieve a standard of efficiency, particularly by night, that even practiced old sailors of the tea clipper days would find hard to match. The army crews aboard the 59-foot catch British soldier provide a useful communication service, relaying radio messages from other craft. The yacht is taken over by an entirely new crew of nine at each port of call, and their enthusiastic team manager is skipper on the longest and most exciting third leg. Major Neil Carlier exercises his skill to bring the sun's image skimming across the horizon for an accurate observed position. Captain George Ballings, the most experienced navigator in the race, takes one of the most direct routes to Cape Horn. It brings adventure to nearly 60 degrees south, well within the ice line. For two and a half days, they sail in Arctic conditions amongst the icebergs. It's hard to use a sextant wearing gloves, but in these latitudes, dressing to go on watch takes the crew a good 20 minutes as they struggle into oilies over air crew bunny suits and Arctic underwear. For well over two weeks, they race in seas that are only four degrees above freezing. Some of the larger bergs are three quarters of a mile long and 300 feet high, and from them pour a stream of small growlers, dangerous as a minefield in the short polar night. Some yachts experience actual icing on deck, and Guia was once prevented from reefing by a solidly frozen mainsail. Ahead of them lies the southernmost tip of America, the legendary Cape Horn. A wild, isolated promontory of massive rock jutting far out into the roaring forties and deflecting their fury into some of the world's most treacherous seas. In these turbulent waters, the strength of the prevailing wind from astern demands constant vigilance from the helmsman to prevent the yacht from broaching in the heavy following swell. Each rolling wave lifts the boat bodily upwards and forwards, surging her along its length to let her sink again, wallowing in the succeeding trough. As the boats pass the horn, the weather lives up to its capricious reputation. 
treating the yachts to everything from light airs to a storm force 10. Now the fleet heads north up the South American coast making for Rio de Janeiro. Soon the leading boats are well into the warmer waters of the South Atlantic and the crews feel welcome relief from the tension of sailing in the exhausting Southern Ocean while the smaller and slower craft continue the long cold struggle. Great Britain too is the first to arrive to find sun-drenched Rio in carnival mood. Mexican Sayula at the start of the vital pursuit race back to England, looking as immaculate as the day she left Portsmouth. It's hard to believe she was rolled over to 150 degrees on the tough second leg, yet continued to make such a fast time, she's still overall handicap leader. The intricate needlework on her sail is the only visible sign of the vast distances she's travelled. Preter's transom has a new aluminium extension to give her more lift. Adventure is challenging strongly and will soon gain her third victory in four legs. The big fiberglass catch Second Life, like Adventure and Sayula, is a production boat giving a consistent performance. Although her crew never make the prize list, they can now celebrate joining the modest band of yachtsmen who've rounded the horn under sail. Skipper Roddy Ainsley must feel well pleased with the boat's trouble-free voyage. Burton Cutter is now back in the race after her disappointing withdrawal from the southern legs, but with the consolation of having proved her speed with the fastest ever passage from Cape Town. In her private race home with GB2, the fortunes of the first leg are reversed. This time, Burton Cutter goes around the non-existent Azores High and is beaten by GB2, taking a direct route. A stitch in time saves nine is certainly true of sail repairs. On a long voyage, the sails suffer the strain of constant use for weeks on end and the stitching wears out. There are sewing machines on board to cope with more serious damage, but it's difficult to spread out the vast areas of wet sail cloth in the confined space of the cabin to replace a complete panel. When a really large Genoa or Spinnaker blows out, it can take two days to repair. Sunset at sea brings the tranquility of the wide open spaces and the full glory of the evening sky. Sadly, all voyages must come to an end. As familiar landmarks appear, regret that the long adventure is nearly over gives way to joy at anticipated reunions. 
Great Britain, too, finishes with a spinnaker flying flourish to take line honours and the Duke of Edinburgh's award for active service personnel. But it's Mexican Sayula who sails in the worthy winner of the Whitbread Trophy for the fastest voyage round the world on corrected time. She comes back to a tumultuous bank holiday welcome. Red Trophy is presented by Prince Philip at the Mansion House. Ramon Carlin of Sayula and his international crew celebrate winning a race that made history, bringing together yachtsmen from 15 nations in an unforgettable and unique adventure. 